One, two, one, two. Turn that music up a little. Shout out to Haley. Mark Thompson, you a fool for this one. Let me change my words, you a king for this one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Make It Plain, the podcast. We're glad to have you join us, and we appreciate you. We have a very special guest in studio with us today. She is none other than one of the co-chairs and co-founders of the Women's March Incorporated. She uh, led the first Women's March that was on the mall the day after Donald Trump was elected president. It was the largest worldwide march in history. It was large on the mall. It was much bigger than the inauguration, uh, despite what he says. But it was also the largest march worldwide. She led it along with her three other co-chairs, Linda Sarsu, Carmen Perez, Bob Bland. Um, But she's here with us now as one of the, well, the only co-chair that is an African-American woman. Uh, We're happy to have her here in Daily News from the Resistance Studios here in New York, Tamika Mallory. Oh, man, I love this, Mark. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, I was glad, glad to so have you. So excited to have you back out here doing what you do best. I don't know what we would do without you. Well, thank you. you well, we know? don't know what we would do without you. Oh, well, thank you very much. So the Women's March these days, where where are things? What's the, the status of the Women's March? Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that there's... You know, been, there's been some turmoil, as in any movement. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, you know, we don't want people to think that's something extraordinary or, or, or unique to the Women's March. That's what happens. Mm-hmm. So, but where where is the Women's March Women's now? March is actually strong. I mean, you know, the way in which, and I have to tell people all the time and remind them that the way that the Women's March started was very backwards, right? Yeah. So a woman goes out and says, we want to march in Washington, D.C., and within the next six weeks, we plan the largest mass mobilization in the history of the country. Um, and, you know, it was it, it was one of those things where under normal circumstances, you have an organization, you have people you know, people you've been working with, you bring on new folks, you come together and you plan something. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, we went the opposite. We had the big day coming and we started working with people we've never met before. We don't know one another's values. Most of them were not really activists. You know, some of us were, but not everyone. And so there, it was, it was very, as I said, backwards. And now we're trying to right side the ship. So we're in the process of announcing a a uh, board that is much more diverse that has you know a lot of voices especially since we've learned so much over the last three years plus um, you know we've had the opportunity to see where the most vulnerable communities are and 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 how we can have women that represent those communities to be a part of the work that we're doing so that's that's really you know the it's really about infrastructure which is something that again we were able to put together for a march, but not necessarily for an organization. Mm-hmm. And when you hear about the Women's March, it almost sounds like we're talking about a 25-year-old organization. We're still in the infant stages. Yeah, you know, yeah. we're just learning how to walk. And and speaking of diversity, obviously you're going to expand it, but prior to the Women's March, the feminist movement itself mm-hmm. was not known mm-hmm. for its diversity. Right. Well, the Women's March is a microcosm of everything that's happening in America, period. Mm-hmm. You know, in the world, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that the movement... The feminist movement in general has never properly represented women of color. And I have to say that even today, even with all the work that we've done um, with the Women's March, we still are not there. There's still much work to be done. And that is why we're in the process of, you know, reshaping and reorganizing our work and and how we speak to the concerns of women, all types of women, because we know women are not a monolith. And therefore, we have all types of issues that we care about. Um, But we want to be able to center women who are most impacted and make sure that the voices of those who are uh, in the most marginalized situation and circumstances within this country and across the world are at the center of our platform. That is something that did not happen in the past. Uh, No one has been successful at pulling something like that together. And in fact, if you look at the platform that the Women's March has put forward and has continued to work on for the last three years, um, you know, it is one of the most diverse platforms that 
the movement has ever seen in terms of of anything that is under the the auspice of a feminist, a feminist movement. Um, and so, you know, we're proud of the work that we've done. And with all the turmoil, I'm so glad that I did not just start in the movement, you know, right at the beginning of the Women's March in, in, in November of 2016, because if that were the case, I would have lost my mind. But mm. because I've been involved in right. the movement all my life, I know that, you know, trouble doesn't last always. That's first of all. And second of all, it's going to be some stuff. Yeah. They're going to be some drama. Well, but I want to go to that was not your beginning. You you've been involved in movement since you were a teenager, oh, yeah. if, if not earlier. Yeah, I was but, much younger than a teen. But as a as a, a woman involved in organizing and civil rights, executive director of National Action Network, Reverend Sharpton's organization, as a black woman, mm. had you been fully involved and had you felt did you feel included within the feminist movement Mm -hmm. as much before the women's march i've never even paid attention to the feminist movement wow you know i and that's not unusual for a lot of black women in your generation it wasn't even a concern of mine didn't feel like home to me and in fact i never i i it never spoke to me you know and my concerns you know do i believe today that i am a feminist absolutely and i i own that i own being a womanist a feminist all the different uh I, i i i feel like it's okay for me to own all those things and to define what they mean for myself and then to work on them in that light. Um, you know, there's some people who say, well, I don't believe in, you know, calling myself a feminist because it doesn't represent me. Well, I choose to be the one to walk in the door, kick the door open, mm-hmm. in fact, and ensure mm-hmm. that our platform is, is is a part of what is being discussed and dealt with. But, you know, I'm a civil rights baby. Um, I come out of the tradition of the civil rights movement, you know, uh, working with National Action network we really studied and focused on dr king and his principles and and so many of the women who were around dr king at that time were a really you know important figures in terms of our history unfortunately the history books you know if if it covers the women who were there during the time that dr king was out on the streets and really you know in his in his prominent stage, you know, if it covers it at all, it's a brush over. It's almost right, like the right, women are right, not really mentioned. Right. But we know that there were strong women um, in the movement at that time. And when I, you know, as I came up through the movement, I recognized that the women were really the backbone of mm-hmm. everything that Reverend Sharpton and Reverend Jackson and, you know, all the different leaders that backbone we've come into contact. Backbone of the church, of absolutely. every black church there is. And, 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 and we've continued to be that. And, you know, and I have to say that I also um, participate in being the backbone within the civil rights community. Right. So. But but even though you weren't a feminist, you were aware of the role women played. Absolutely. And advocated for those roles Absolutely. to still be recognized. Absolutely. So now that the Women's March has been led by you and people have had an opportunity as black women to see uh, you in that role, maybe even become mm-hmm. more acquainted with feminism and more attracted to, to it, are you finding more black women wanting to call themselves feminists or fully participating in the feminist movement? Well, you know, I think, first of all, that black women have always been a part of the feminist movement, even though they may have taken very serious, serious issues with the diversity, the lack of diversity right. within the platform and also the way in which they were treated. So because I, I I read books from black women who talk about being feminist, you know, looking at Kimberly Crenshaw as an example of mm-hmm. a woman who calls herself a feminist but yet is very critical of the women's movement. Um, so I think that women have always been there. I do think we brought a new cachet, a new a new sexy, if you will, <laughs> to the Women's March. You know, we're pretty cute, and people, <laughs> right. other cute people want to be down, so the cute ladies do it together, um, you know. Um, and so, you know, I think we have been able to bring new voices in. But I'll be, I'll be very honest, and as I said, there's a lot of work that has to be done because when these women um, come into contact with this movement, mm-hmm. you know, many of them have been turned off. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, unfortunately, white women have not really changed. I mean, even in even though there are many who are doing a damn good job of trying to learn about themselves and their 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 
uh, privilege and are really trying to invest in the movement in a different way and show up in a different way, there are still very, very serious concerns in terms of even the acknowledgement of the issues that black women have, I mean, that, that white women have uh, have presented within the movement. There's yeah. very There's still a resistance to deal with that. And we saw that manifest in your ordeal. Um, you were um, held to account because of your very natural relationship mm -hmm. with some of us in the black community mm -hmm. that you've always had, in, including Minister Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And so the template, you know, here in America is always, you know, we're treated like children as African Americans. Mm -hmm. You've got to infantilize. Infantilize. That's, what that's right. That's me. right. Infantilize. We we <laughs> have to. I used the word you taught me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, We've got to, you know, repudiate each other and mm -hmm. get away from each other and mm -hmm. take a position against each other mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And uh, but people like you and me aren't politicians dependent on corporate PAC money. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, folk mm -hmm. got to do it because they know that money goes away or whatever. And that's that's their problem. But that's not the position we're in. And it's not. A, so it's not a genuine thing. Mm -hmm. um, has. Has that issue, and and I and I, let me just say this: I commend you and others I've been involved with because we've been in dialogue with with members and leaders of the Jewish faith, absolutely trying to come to to greater understanding of, mm -hmm. of one another's uh, uh, um, struggles yeah. and have made progress in that regard. Absolutely, the people who ain't around in the conversations no more never wanted it to be successful in the first place. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to tear up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And as I said to you, because of the diversity of the Women's March. And because it represents such a broad swath, that's why it was under attack. Mm -hmm. Just like Dr. Mm -hmm. King's beloved community, mm -hmm. he had to mm -hmm. be moved out of the way because if you have people begin to change, you say white women have not changed much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for those who have and are changing, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. you can't have black women and white women on the same Absolutely. page agreeing Absolutely. on every point. Absolutely. Not say 100 points, black and white women agreeing on 80. no. <laughs> That's then the Absolutely. whole system changes. Some right. of these men ain't getting elected no more ever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But in in light of what the process you've you've been through is is the women's march able to keep going, able to move forward, and able to continue to to bridge the divisions and bring about some cohesiveness. So you know, I think. Um, that first of all, the purpose of us bringing a new board together is to really help to reshape, not reshape, but to continue the work that the Women's March is doing, again, to expand, and then also to bring different people uh, who who have not just different expertise, but also, you know, not necessarily folks that agree on everything, but people who can come to the table and figure out strategies for going, you know, for a continuing our work for 100 years, right? That's the goal, to make sure that we keep going. And I think that that is 100% possible when you have the, the, the class of board members that we are going to announce in the next few weeks. These mm -hmm. are people who have been doing this work for um, a long time, or even if it's a short period of time, they are truly experts at the work of dealing with women, dealing with the crises that women have found ourselves in for all too long, dealing with organizing, dealing with fundraising, dealing with all of these different aspects. So the foundation, I believe, is a part of how we keep going. Mm -hmm. It's having a strong foundation. But in addition to that, we have seen other movements have these issues, as you said, where there is turmoil. But the issue for us is, are we? do we have the wherewithal and also the courage to keep pushing? And we do. Yeah. We're not going to yeah. stop. Yeah. And so because we have that, we know we will be blessed um, as we have been blessed. Every time we found ourselves in some, you know, crazy situation, somehow or another, uh, we always came through and we were able to pull off. I mean, when you think about what we have done, the fact that in the same year we had the largest mass mobilization in the history of the country and the first women's convention in 40 years to happen in one year. People told us we were out of our minds 
shine about both of them, but we did it. Every women's march that we've had since the first one have been successful. We went to Las Vegas during the midterm elections because we wanted to, well, before the midterm elections, because we knew that Las Vegas, well, Nevada was going to be an important state in terms of the midterms, and we won in Nevada. And across the country, women showed up. Even with all the turmoil, all the drama we were going through, we invited Bernie Sanders to the conference. There, that was <laughs> right. that was the biggest thing. I mean, it was like people were really literally sick physically <laughs> from the amount of negative yeah. press we received, phone calls. I remember calling you and you were like, yeah, but I don't understand how this happened. I'm like, Mark, <laughs> listen to me. I'm what you said. I'm with you. You, right. we and you right. together. Right. Right. But there were serious questions about yeah. what was happening yeah. Yeah. with, you know, Bernie Sanders coming to our convention and, and it appeared to some as if he was the uh, keynote speaker yeah, a, for the a man, entire a man convention, a man, right, right, right. Yet, in, but yet the conference was named after Maxine Waters, mm-hmm. and she was the first person mm-hmm. to confirm her um, her keynote speech on that Saturday. And just because Bernie's schedule got him there a day before, the whole world blew up. <laughs> we almost we lost sponsors, friends, wow. everything yeah. over yeah. something like that. So every single time. We keep coming back. Yeah. And I believe that's because the work that we're doing is actually a ministry. It's not just, you know, just us out here trying to have an organization for organization's purposes, but really because God has for us work that he knows needs to be done. And it's not going to happen with just black women, with just white. This is a women's movement that right. needs all different types of voices involved. You know, now that you remind me of that, it, it just goes to show you, everyone, the way things work, you, you, you lost support because of your, your relationship with Bernie Sanders. Right. Then you lose support because of your relationship with Mr. Farrakhan. Two people don't have anything to do with <laughs> each other. But it still speaks to a need mm. for people to control and direct and oversee the affairs of women. Mm-hmm. Y'all just can't do what you want to mm-hmm. do. We can, no, no, no. Y'all can't do it this way. You have to do it in, in, in this fashion. Um, do women, though— White women and women of color, for that matter, realize now, finally, the power they really have. Mm. Mm. I, I'm not, I, not from as a man looking on the outside. I'm still not sure y'all do, but I, I want to ask you because mm. you all can literally decide. Old dude is over. Mm-hmm. If, if we all fall off a cliff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Y'all, okay. mm-hmm. if we, as a matter of fact, if every man, I know it's not going to happen, every mm-hmm. man say, okay, we just going to go with Trump, black men included. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Women. Can, women. Y'all can, just, no, this is this is a wrap. Mm-hmm. Just like in everything else, in all the other aspects of life you name, when women have influence and, and power, if black women left the black church, black church is over. Mm-hmm. But do women really realize in, in, the, in the larger perspective, mm-hmm. policy, elections, question. Do women, and I think it's, I think it's also that goes for young women too. Mm-hmm. Does the average millennial sister know I have the power mm-hmm. to actually direct the affairs of this country? You know, I think we know we have power, but we've yet to reconcile our own issues in terms of women in general. We can't get on the same page. Black women have done a good job of voting together right. in the last, in many elections, um, elections that matter. But so many of us, even black folks within, you know, even black women within, our, even black women have decided not to vote at all at times, right? So there is still a lack of us being on the same page about how to use the power we have. Mm -hmm. I think we know we have it, but we don't necessarily know when or even, we're not, we're, we're, we're so frustrated with everything that's going on, I don't think we even use it when we're supposed to together for the right reasons and don't get us upset with each other because then we use it in the total opposite direction. So yes, I think we know we have power because the stats are there. We know we have a lot of power, you know, our brains all the way down to our toes. We have power. Listen to sister Cardi B talk. (laughs) We have a lot of power. Anyway, this is this is a political, uh, no, cultural show. Yeah, yeah, but we we, we, we don't talk about, about that. Now. <laughs> Do you know? No, I, 
yeah, I, I know. Well, you know what? We've not, we've only met once, but we've communicated a lot via social media and, you know, talking to each other in the DMs. And, you know, she's posted me on her page. Because my, so, my new song for summer 2019 is Wish Wish. Oh, you like Wish Wish. <laughs> oh, yeah, like it's it. hard. It is. It's hard. She, <laughs> I posted something about Cardi the other day, and I said, the language is very strong, <laughs> but the point is real. Is real. It's real. You know. It's real. You know. So, so look. This is another woman who you would think this young lady, Latinx sister, who grew up in Highbridge in the Bronx. Shout out to our brother, my son, um, who also who knows Cardi very, very well. Um, you know, here here she is, this young woman that you know she's very successful, but. She, and 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 most artists, not most, many artists who are as successful as Cardi B will turn away from the movement, mm -hmm. politics, and mm -hmm. all that. And here she is consistently using her voice. I saw she tweeted something about Bernie Sanders, um, I believe today, where she says, you know, I've been doing my research on him, and he's been fighting for, you know, peep for us for a long time. You know, I'm, I, I don't necessarily know if I agree with all of that, you know, in terms of when I really do my research but the point is the sister is really invested in trying to educate herself and right. then educate her community and she is not afraid to take a hard stance yeah. a very hard stance on a number of issues so yeah we know we have power but how we use it is still it still needs to be fine tuned the thing I like about her her public um, self education mm. is, is that everybody can see it and it's it reflects what I think the average person is doing. Right. You know, in in her generation, right. and maybe even older. I mean, some right. folk forty and fifty years old trying to figure it out. Right. Well, because uh, well, yeah. I mean, because some folk been working all their lives, mm -hmm. raising a kid or more, taking care of parents. Absolutely. They just, ain't got time to be just being ignorant. Yeah. Some of y'all ain't got time to listen to make it plain. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's why we got to be here every day. So maybe one day we can get a little <laughs> get a little, little droplet. You know, you know, got to get you got to get people more than one M and M. I told you about that. That's a whole other thing. We won't get right. into that. But, <laughs> no, but, I'm not. Nobody wants you can't. You don't share one M and M. But um, to 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 see her as I watch her, I mean, you can see her taking it in, absorbing. It's a it's a process that she's going through that I think others can benefit from watching her do it and, and even have some some inspiration for it. You have been a single mother. Mm. When did, well, first of all, though, when did you know, because your parents were involved in the movement, mm -hmm. they were close to Reverend Sharp and they kind of raised you in it. But, you mm -hmm. know, we all follow our parents, but then there's a point when we, right, when we own fully, it. Right. when did you know, how old were you when you knew that uh, this, this was you when you were in it? Well, I, I don't know if it was an age. I mean, I guess there was an age, but it wasn't so much, that it was tragedy. You know, it was when right. my son's father was murdered, that's when I started to be like, whoa, okay, you know, what I started to 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 reflect on what what I was learning and hearing in the movement. Like you can be close to it and you know, and be a participant without really absorbing. And once my son's father was murdered, I think that's when I began to become acutely aware of like of how the system played a role in his murder, you know, and in, in just his life, how he was living, his parents being perpetual drug abusers, the homelessness, and just so many different issues in that one person's life that it made me realize that my parents, what they had been doing was um, – was was really making me a well-rounded individual because I was learning about all the aspects of our civil and human rights, and I was able to put into action, um, you know, a a a a sort of a, a way of addressing gun violence, but not from just the perspective of picking up a gun. Rather, what are all the social concerns that allowed the gun to make it into the hands of, of another individual? And so that's kind of, I guess I was about 18 or 19 years old. Yeah, I was 19 when my son's father was murdered. And that's, that's, that was the beginning of my own relationship with this work. You know, not through my parents' eyes, not because my mother was beating me with a, a comb, 
on top of my head on Saturday <laughs> mornings, forcing me out the door to go to the rally. Yeah. You know, not because my father and I used to stand at the elevator. I remember we grew up in the projects, and on Saturday morning, I never wanted to go to the rallies. So I remember my father standing at the elevator with me, and I was, you know, my lips was poking, and I was so upset. And, and Daddy turned around and looked at me and said, get your damn lips in your mouth. You're a father. <laughs> knock you out. <laughs> he was so frustrated. And I think about that all the time. I'm so grateful that that they kept pushing because if they didn't, right. then I don't know where I would be today. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, these presidential candidates. Oh God, what, let's focus on. <laughs> what, it's <laughs> so stressful. Really? Why? Why is it stressful? It's stressful. It's stressful because it's too overwhelming. It's too many people. No, I mean it, it's a clown show. It's like mm. it's just a clown show, and it's not that I'm saying all of you not impressed with even I'm not saying the candidates are clowns. Okay, I'm saying just the whole situation. It's like we're 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 talking about things. Just to just for an election and not like people are not ready to make radical sacrifices, you know, and that's what we need in this moment. We need people who are like, damn, being the president, if I have to give my life literally to make a change in our society, I'm ready to do that. And I don't and that that's just not what happens during presidential elections. And then you have 100,000 people. De Blasio is running. He can't even fire a cop who's here in New York City who choked Eric Garner to death. You know, uh, it's just so much going on. It's a, and, then, and then obviously we're fighting against the clown of all clowns. Yeah, yeah, the, the supreme clown. The supreme clown. So it's just a mess to well, me. Well, you know, what's interesting. But I don't know if we can beat him. Which is what scares me. Even well, more. And, and and you and I have talked about that offline. That's one of the fears that I have, and 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 I've I've said online though it's because they cheat. You know, well, I, I, I well. was on I was on MSNBC, MSNBC with Lawrence O'Donnell, and you know it's it, you, you appreciate this. You know, I, you and I say a lot that gets us in trouble, and then, I know. and then we look like you know the scared black people until when, it becomes true, right? But then when white folks say it. And you're with them is is comforting, you know. So Lauren said on TV last night, you know, Trump is racist, and he's kind. Now when I say it, it's like black man called Trump racist, controversy. Lauren says, then he said, and we know he's counting on Russia to help him win. And I was like, Phew, man, you said it. You know, that, it, it it really it takes you when were y'all on say MSNBC last night. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I missed we, it. We, yeah, we'll talk about that. But uh, 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 first time in three months. Um, Trump don't last all way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, the but the the point being made that it, it eventually does become popular. It does become popular, and it's just it's topic. just real. Right. He attacked those four sisters in Congress, told them to go back to countries they not even from. Mm. Go back to your country. What country? He should have said to their shithole countries, right? Because that's what he means. And they all live here. They're all right citizens. But I, I like what you said though about. People not just running for office, but taking, um, if necessary, a life-changing or maybe even life-risking stance on a position. Mm. And I said we talked to Mayor Pete last week. You know, they we 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 all talk. I mean, all great people. We talk, and I believe in in using this mic as a forum for people to hear about cans. But I asked Mayor Pete very practically, dude. You got a, a a police officer who killed a brother, mm-hmm. and everybody's upset about it. You you have no power allegedly to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So do you understand that if that officer who just resigned is mm-hmm. not charged in the middle of your presidential campaign, you probably done. Mm-hmm. Well, but is De Blasio <laughs> done because of Eric Garner? I'm just I'm asking. I'm not making. Uh, it, with all due respect, de Blasio was probably done. Before he started. Uh, you you right. know, because the blackout happens, everybody's like, why are you in Iowa? It pulled to 0%. <laughs> with sick, anyway, we not even going to do it. You know what? That's okay. I'm going to just Ma- leave that alone. Marion was at the Super Bowl during a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> he had to Marian come, ba- Barry, he had to come back Jesus. from the Super Bowl. <laughs> They said, no, you got to come back here. We drowning in this blizzard. <laughs> that's what being a mayor, that's why some folk don't need to be the mayor, don't want to be the mayor, because it's like, that's about potholes and blackouts and, <laughs> right. and snow. Running this city. <laughs> right. It ain't about being in other places. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the Washington Post tried to recruit Jesse Jackson to run for mayor because they didn't want mayor to run them. Jesse, I don't want to. <laughs> 
that's, fix no pothole. That ain't that, me. That's <laughs> not his thing. <laughs> he said, that's, I'm above that now. But um, I agree. De Blasio was, I mean, he's not polling well anyway. And that's not just because of Eric Garner. He's just the mayor of New York. That's and he's not known for anything. You know what? But that's he should be right. right. You know, uh, uh, held accountable because he has the power. Does he not have the power? The Absolutely. power. Absolutely, it's on him now. That's that's the only thing. Now, Buddha only... says he does not have the power. That may be true because different cities have different mm-hmm. situations. But, yeah, but influence, De Blasio, influence can get a lot of things done, and. I don't I, I'm not sure. I mean, they all they don't have the power. I don't have the power. It's not in my jersey. But you know what? Your tone and attitude right. towards a particular issue sets the tone for what may or it's may not happen. happen. Right. And, you know, and, and I think that on today, um, one day shy of the fifth anniversary of Eric Garner's uh, murder on camera, um, to have the Department of Justice right. Right. meet with the family and tell them that they will not bring charges against Daniel Pantaleo, the officer responsible for killing Eric Garner. It is not just a disaster and a crisis, but it's actually, what y'all say, an abomination? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, I think I was thinking about it and I said, it's really even disrespectful that they only had one day for the statute of limitations, which would be tomorrow, the 17th, 7-17. That, was, that would be the exact five years, and that's the statute of limitations. So they just said, okay, well, we'll drag this out all the way to until the, the day before and call to these folks you. in when they could have told them this a year ago or, you know, a few months ago, even a few weeks ago. It's really just like effed up. You know what I mean? And de Blasio, he's been saying that he was waiting on the Department of Justice and their investigation to be completed before he made a move. And yet, you know, we'll see what happens. The other thing is, you know, the the hearings that were happening in New York City with the the uh, community. What do you call CCRB? I say CCRB it's, so it's, much. It's citizen the Citizens review board. Community Review Board, which right. is a, a unit that is supposed to investigate the NYPD. It's where you bring your concerns to about right. the NYPD. You know, they had a hearing that folks were at. Obviously, the family advocates were there for many, many days, um, you know, going back and forth to court. And once that hearing is over, the way that the law is currently set up in New York State, they don't even have to review reveal what they intend to do with the individual that's been on trial. So while Daniel Pantaleo was on trial by the CCRB, they do not have to release their decision. So if, in fact, he's going to be, you know, let's just say fined or put on desk duty for a while or whatever may happen or nothing at all, if they just decide to allow him to go back to, you know, business as usual, they don't have to tell the public anything about that. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, the Justice Department folks declining to prosecute. No surprise there. Um, and then I said that to Mayor Buttigieg when he was here that, you know, we have no expectation that's going to happen in, in, in his South situation Bend. either. Yeah. And, and it's just the same routine. Oh, there is, there are no uh, consequences. Mm-hmm. It is legal for the police to kill mm-hmm. black men mm-hmm. here in America. Mm-hmm. Period. You know, Tamika and I are, are, are friends in the struggle, but we're also personal Same. friends and parents. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we have to go through this thing, uh, you know, about our sons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, how do they live and survive in a world like this? Right. And, and the constant worry. Constant worry. I mean, thank God we have each other, though. But it's a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle. Um, When you're trying to raise young black men who you've also taught to be confident and then they've learned from us to be freedom fighters. So, you know, my son's like, oh, I'm not going to. I'm like, dude, (laughs) you just get home. Yeah. Just get home. You know. Indeed, indeed. Uh, But but on the president's candidates, Mm. any of the women impress you? Don't we need a woman president? I I mean, on principle. Yeah, I think absolutely. But you know what? Identity politics, I'm not, that's not my thing right now. I need to know how we're going to beat Trump, one. And then, two, who has the best policies for, um, for, for not, yes, women of, uh, uh, people of color matter. People of color matter. 
but I believe that black people have sp- specific issues in this country that to Reverend Jackson's point, when we were at the Democratic National uh, Committee's uh, African-American Summit in June, um, and, they would, and, and Reverend Jackson said that black people are not at the bottom. While we say that all the time, you know, our people are at the bottom, actually we're at the foundation of this country. So if we uh, lift the foundation, then everybody, people of color, white folks, everyone um, will be made whole. And so I want to see that there's some, there are people who can talk specifically about black folks. You know, when I think about, and this is the third time I mentioned Bernie, so people can be like, oh, she loves Bernie. No. When I think about <laughs> Bernie, that's one of my critiques. And, you know, Linda Sarsour, who's a, a, a Bernie Sanders um, supporter and has been working with him from his previous presidential run to now. Um, you know, I and let me get that straight. When I say working with, I don't that does not mean that she gets a check because, you know, everything we say, they'll be like, yeah, that, you know, that she said that. She, no, I'm just saying they they are they are. Uh, what's the, what do we do? What do we call it? Um, they. I mean, they consult, I guess. No, they don't consult. They don't consult? Because consult, again, the check. See what I'm saying? You got the, So she's not a consultant. She's, she's not, not a an advisor. consultant. She's not on. Yeah, she's, she's, she's just, just a She's just an ally. She's a friend. She's yeah, a supporter. And she and I have Brand had. Brandon and I, we're all friends. Okay, good. So we've all I had. I don't get a check either, y'all. You don't get a check? I don't get no Let's check. Let's get that clear. I don't get a check. <laughs> we're friends. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I listen to him speak, one of my critiques is he has great ideas. Yeah. Ideas I can support. But it's very difficult for him to be able to articulate how it will impact black people specifically. And so this is why better. he's getting better. Even with, you know, his, his, you know, being able to speak to the LGBTQ community, he's getting much better. You can see and, that and, he's and, making And, and, and that's a, because he learned mm-hmm. to, to open up and right. be born. And it wasn't even him. I mean, staff has a lot to do with right, it. Right, right. When you're well, staffed by people, right. they want to do that. But he's surrounded by people now, mm-hmm. a good friend of mine, Ari, as well. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you know we talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he, he's he's doing better. You can see there is a real deliberate intent uh, there to make sure that his 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 communication is inclusive and that it's specific. So I appreciate that now. But there had been an issue with oh, that yeah. in the past. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren, however, is she she speaks about black issues better than some of the black <laughs> folks does. So I, I you know I actually like that about her. Right. But I'm not sure if white women didn't vote for the first homegirl, whether or not they're gonna vote for their second homegirl. Well, well that's, that's the question I'm really asking. And again, I'm not endorsing anybody either. The love, same here. Love not Bernie, ready, love, love Kamala. Yeah. I love Kamala. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's all of this is great. But what I'm asking you, since we all agree mm. that you all mm. can say what's going to happen. You mm-hmm. all can literally decide this. Yeah. Is a woman necessary in order to really get women mobilized? Well, you know, Mark, I just, I, I can't say. I'm saying. I want to say, one, I want to say absolutely a woman being on the ticket okay. is important. It is time. Um, and I think it will be valuable to any candidate uh, any male candidate particularly to choose a woman to stand with them or for us to have a woman to win the Democratic no- uh, nomination. I, I, okay. I, I say all of that. However, understanding how white women vote specifically, because when you say women can make a choice, it's not just black women or women of color who have to do it. We need yeah, white women right. as well to be with us. And they have not proven themselves to be an ally to their own community, to the women that come from their own community, women that look like them. They had the pantsuit nation. They had all of that. And I have heard and voted for, well, voted for Roy Moore, (laughs) voted for Trump. And let me tell you, when I'm, I have a conversation with a white woman on the Amtrak train the other day. And she said to me, I hate Hillary. I mean, I just, I hate, I just can't. And the way in which she was speaking about it, I said, well, damn. Like, this is really some deep stuff. So I said, well, what is it exactly? Her emails, and she's a liar. And I said, this lady is still talking about some emails. Today, I had a conversation with another lady on a plane. She's a Trump supporter. She said, "I, I don't agree with everything he does, but I just couldn't support Hillary because of emails. And, but, you know, like I told you, I thought 
crab in a barrel was just a thing for us. Black folks. Yeah, for black. But folks. when a white woman called the show in 2016, so no, that's white women too. Mm. When you there is internalized mm. oppression everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're right; it's a tricky thing. So one rises and everybody's no, no, no. Who who said she could be the president? That's right. You know, and I and, think having their husbands to be in power makes them feel like they have still a stronger proximity to power. Because I think what happens when a woman gets in office, then it becomes competitive. When their husbands are in position of power, there's like a cloak of protection. Well, we all, we got to, we got to get over that because this ain't going to get it where we at right now. I hope we, you know what, I'm going to predict today because we've said a lot of things and I want to, I want to end on a positive note with this particular subject. I'm going to predict that With the children at the border, okay, and with all that we now know about Trump, they can say what they want about the Mueller Mueller report. We know what we saw. We know what we heard. And I believe more women, white women, women of color, just people in general, are paying attention. And then in this particular election, we are going to vote like we've never voted, and we're going to vote in the right direction. I'm going to predict that today. As we go. You are an inspiration to a lot of young women. Uh, you're invited to speak all over the country to young women in all types of different situations. And, and those of you who are mentoring young women or raising young women or working with young women or teaching Sunday school or regular school to young women, mm-hmm. please invite Tamika Mallory as a speaker. Mark. No, really, be- because you are an ins- you, you're an inspiration. First of all, tell people how they can get in touch with you and invite you. What well, well, can I say first before I do that? We were talking about the conference and how men, a man being invited um, is, you know, was problematic for folks, but you didn't talk about how you came up in there and blew the whole conference yeah, Against up. my will. Just blew you the were, you whole were, you were, women's <laughs> convention up. You weren't, I wasn't going to do it. I begged you not for to me not to do it. There. And, and I got to be say that I ain't supposed panel, to. You're supposed to be talking about being a male feminist and the support. I did. And you talked about it, but you blew it, tore the house <laughs> down. So when you talk no. about people inviting folks to speak, this cat's who you want to have there. But anyway, <laughs> you can reach me at Tamika D. Mallory on everything. Most people DM me, and I have a team of folks who actually check the DMs, and we get back to folks. So reach out to me at Tamika D. Mallory on everything. And, of course, my website is Tamika D. Mallory. And I've learned so much from you about what some a lot of young women are dealing with that we just don't know. Mm. So if you could leave leave a word of inspiration, someone either listening now is dealing with something as a young woman, mm. or someone listening now knows a young woman that's dealing with something, trying mm. to either get out of it, get forward, figure some kind of way out. Mm. Could you leave? that young woman with the word of inspiration. You know, this weekend on Sunday, as I mentioned to you, I went to uh, the first event of a young woman named Maggie Carey. She is on Love and Hip Hop. And she was shot, I don't know if you remember, in Irvin Plaza uh, when our brother Shanduke McFadder from GMAC, right. you know, his brother was killed at a concert right. that happened there. Um, I guess it was about two years ago where um, Banga is, was, is his name. He was shot and killed there. Maggie Carter was there in the space, and she was hit by a stray bullet. Mm-hmm. Um, Maggie Carey. And so she held an event on Sunday where women who have been shot came together. Um, first time I've ever seen anything like it. I'm talking about women who've been shot in their face by, mm. you know, uh, drive-bys and, uninter- and unintended circumstances, women uh, who've been shot with domestic issues. I mean, one woman talked about how a man shot her and hit her in the chest, and then when she was laying on the ground, he put a shotgun on her back and shot her, but she still lived. Lord, uh, another woman whose face has been uh, changed because she was shot through almost almost through one of her eyes. I mean, a whole plate on the side of her face. I mean, just so, so, so much. And it was so powerful to listen to their stories. And, but the one thing I kept hearing over and over was, I shouldn't have been there. Um, You know, I I shouldn't have dated him. Maybe if I hadn't done this. And I thought to myself, and I said in the room, it's not your fault. We need to stop taking on the responsibility for other people doing us wrong. So whether that's the American government trying to tell us to go pull ourselves up by the bootstraps that we don't have the boots to, to even think about 
how to go forward in our society, um, you know, whether it's the baby father who left or the husband who cheated and we're thinking, well, maybe if I lost weight, maybe if I cooked better, maybe if I whatever, we keep on taking on the responsibility of what the world has done to us. And I think the only thing that we need to, it's only our fault if we don't pick up our power and push forward as hard as we can. And I think that that's the only thing I would say to young women is don't let people make you feel like your challenges are your fault alone. The only thing that is your fault is if you don't take those challenges and turn them into triumphs. Timika Mallory. This will not be the last time we speak. No. Sisters, she's always been a resident of Make It Plain. She'll be with us. Thank her for all her support as we bring this show back to a new platform. She stood by my side in, in every way in us doing that, and we're going to keep on pushing. Uh, to Arguing all the way through because that's what argue. you like to do is argue with me all the time. Okay, no. Yes. We had one argument in our lifetime. No, we had one screaming match. We have many times when we have <laughs> arguments. We had one argument, and it was one screaming match, and that was it. No, no, no. We ain't never. We, 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 we was last time we ain't disagreed on nothing. Right. You saw it there now. <laughs> that, that don't count. <laughs> Look at it right now. <laughs> that, I'm, 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 I'm disagreeing. No, you, we had, that we, we disagree. Had few, we had another argument outside of that one because. Of a, of a conference call. We, you got mad at me for telling you don't bring certain people on the conference call. You told me, I'm not going to do that. Don't tell me to do that. <laughs> I don't even remember all that. But, but. Right, I do. Women don't forget anything. Let the record show. I am cooperative. <laughs> you are. And humble and you are. supportive. 99% of, I mean, I don't you know. You always are. It's always a good, healthy dialogue because I always learn when I finish Debating with Mark. Well, I, and I and I and I I learned as well, but we don't. No, we we good. You are one of my best friends, and I appreciate you. And I'm so glad you're back on this on the air. Your show is going to be great. You needed to break free. You know, sometimes what we see as the challenge is actually the moment, the thing that takes us to the next level. Mm. You're independent, ready to get out there. And, and, and throughout this presidential election, if we don't have you, then we don't have anything. So Bless you. Thank make you. it plain. Thank you. Folks, join us. Uh, this is the podcast, but join us every day mm. as well, 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Go to makeitplain.com to get subscribed for the daily show or daily live podcast, as we like to call it. Uh, a lot more to come. Mm. We thank Tamika Mallory. Thank you for having me. It has been Made Plain. It's time to get woke.